this sort of uh, cartoon model um, where these are different amino acids that form different shapes uh, inside the protein and we'll get into all of that uh, now. So amino acids have a general formula. The backbone of every amino acid looks like this. There's a nitrogen in, amino, in the amino group. There's a side chain which we are just referring to as R and then there's a carboxyl group on the right. So this is the backbone. So um, there would be another amino acid here and another amino acid here in a protein and this side chain here is going to be different in each different amino acid. So there are 20 amino acids 20 common amino acids that are grouped together based on whether this R side chain is polar hydrophilic or nonpolar hydrophobic. So these are the 20 common amino acid side chains. Uh, you'll see in the blue box is what we are referring to as the R group. Um, again, each of these boxes is um, separated by whether the R group is nonpolar polar, positively or negatively charged. I don't want you to memorize all of these R groups, uh, but it is important to know um, when we're talking about an amino acid such as alanine or lysine that their R groups are different and that those R groups are going to impart a different function to the different amino acids. Here's a couple of examples of R groups. Uh, over here in alanine, we have a carboxyl group, CH3. This is nonpolar. Uh, over here, we have glutamate. Glutamate here has COO minus, a carboxylic acid, so this is negatively charged. Um, so, of course, it's polar because of that negative charge. Over here in lysine, we have an amino group here. And of course, this is a positive charge, so this is polar. Finally, we have an uncharged polar molecule. So there's no charge to this molecule, serine. So there's no ion, but there is polarity because of the electronegativity of this oxygen. So there's a partial negative charge here. So it is polar, but it's not charged. Amino acid molecules form together in a special type of bond called a peptide bond. A peptide bond is a dehydration synthesis because the prod one of the products is water, H2O. So we're losing uh, an H2O molecule in this process when we form this peptide bond. This is our peptide bond right here. So this is amino acid residue 1 and this is amino acid 2 and they're joined together with this special bond called a peptide bond. If we have three amino acids joined together by peptide bonds, we're going to have a tripeptide. So here's amino acid 1 with functional group 1, here's amino acid 2, functional group 2, and 3 with functional group 3. So we're going to form these three amino acids together. So we're going to form two peptide bonds, one here and one here. So we're going to lose two molecules of water because this is a dehydration synthesis, and we're going to have two peptide bonds between our three amino acids, one here and one here. This is called a tripeptide. A polypeptide is another word for a protein. So a polypeptide is hundreds of amino acids joined head to tail in long chains and they're joined together by peptide bonds. So how do we get a linear group of amino acids joined together in peptide bonds to look like this fully formed protein? Well, we have four levels of organization. Primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. Primary structure refers to the sequence of amino acids. So this is not so much a shape as it is simply the fact that this amino acid is connected to this amino acid and on and on in a row. So it's the sequence of amino acids. In secondary structure, we start to have a shape. Two common secondary structures are the alpha helix and the beta sheet. We're going to talk about those in the next several slides. Remember, these are held together by hydrogen bonds between the amino acids. 
these secondary structures fold together into what we call a tertiary structure. This is the full three-dimensional shape of the protein. This is important because a lot of a protein's function is based on the shape of the protein. And finally, not all proteins have quaternary structure, but if you have more than one tertiary structure joined together, um, you have a quaternary structure. So this is more than one group of, um, of uh, polypeptides, more than one group of amino acids linked together uh, joined into one molecule. So here is primary structure. And again, this is the sequence of amino acids. Here we just have uh, four amino acids in a row, uh, cysteine, serine, leucine, and phenylalanine. These are all, remember, here's our primary structure, here's our R group, and these are held together with these peptide bonds. One example of this is ribonuclease. This is a polypeptide chain containing 124 amino acids. Here you can see some of them here. And these are just, this is a primary structure, so it's just a one-letter code for each amino acid. Secondary structure is where we start having a little bit of three-dimensional shape. Here is an alpha helix. You can see that this protein or um, polypeptide is sort of coiled in this helical shape. So each one of these R groups is our functional group, and our amino acid uh, are linked together with these peptide bonds, but they started to form this coil. And there's a hydrogen bond between um, every fourth amino acid. So this amino acid oops, and this guy are linked together with a hydrogen bond, such that we get this three-dimensional coiling inside our molecule. The other one, common secondary structure is the beta sheet. This is where you have uh, one length of amino acids and then some sort of space between them, could be whatever, and then a second group of amino acids. And these come up next to each other and they're joined by hydrogen bonds so that these two different parts of the protein here and here, these two different sections of the same protein come together so that, such that they're close to each other in physical proximity and they start forming these hydrogen bonds between each other laterally and that sort of keeps these two sections of the proteins locked into what we call a beta pleated sheet. Finally, when you have alpha helices and beta sheets uh, packing together in the same molecule, you get the final tertiary structure. And the tertiary structure is a word for the 3D conformation or the 3D shape of the protein. And each protein that has these primary and secondary structures will continue to fold till it re reaches its final tertiary structure, final form. Tertiary structures are held together by many different types of interactions. Uh, they can be hydrophobic interactions. So if you think of this as one, this is one long polypeptide, however now of course it has a 3D shape. Um, if there are hydrophobic residues, hydrophobic R groups, on different parts of the amino acids, uh, excuse me, different parts of the polypeptide, they can come together and um, form hydrophobic interactions. Remember, there's water all around our, uh, there's water all around our polypeptide here. So the hydrophobic groups are going to try to get away from the water and cluster together into a hydrophobic core. Uh, secondly, Different parts of the uh, polypeptide can be held together by ionic bonding. So if you have one R group over on this part of the protein and one amino acid with an R group on this part of the protein, they can form ionic bonds between very different parts of the protein. So there might be, as, there might be hundreds of amino acids between here and here but because we're folding in a 3D shape, these two amino acids can get close enough to form an ionic bond. Hydrogen bonding can occur in the same manner. Very different locations on our protein can fold together to form hydrogen bonds. And finally, there's what's called a disulfide linkage, which is two sulfurs with a covalent bond. All of these kind of interactions cause our protein to hold its three-dimensional conformation or shape. Finally, we have what's called 
sometimes what we have is an oligomeric protein. This is a complex of more than one chain that interact with each other. So if we have a primary structure, which is our sequence, moving into a secondary structure, which are alpha helices and, and uh, beta pleated sheets held together by hydrogen bonds. These fold further into our tertiary structure. Again, this is the 3D shape of the protein held together by all those bonds we just talked about. If you have more than one unit, so more than one separate chain that come together, we call that a quaternary structure. Here we have hemoglobin, which is a globular protein that carries oxygen and it has four subunits, so it has four separate polypeptide chains that have each folded into their own tertiary structure and come together to form the quaternary structure of this protein. These quaternary structures are held together with the same type of bonds that hold tertiary structures together. So why is protein folding necessary? Well, the function of a protein is largely determined by its shape and the charge of very specific amino acid residues and how they're located relative to one another. So when we have a protein that folds into its specific 3D conformation or shape, amino acids that belong to very different regions of the polypeptide chain are brought together in a very unique geometry to form sort of a cavity called the binding site. So here, we have a enzyme called toparsomerase 1B. It has four important amino acids. This is arginine, 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 and tyrosine. Now these are located in very different locations on our um, primary structure. So you have one, arginine is the 488th amino acid, one is the 590th, one is number 632, then you have a tyrosine way down here at 723. So if these were just in a straight line, they wouldn't be close enough to interact. However, after this protein folds together into its final 3D conformation, you can see that all of these four amino acids come together such that they form a special binding site which allows the protein to perform its specific function. So these special 3D shape binding sites are what allow proteins to interact with a specific ligand. So here is an example of this, is an antibody antigen interaction. A ligand is a general term for any molecule that another molecule binds to. So here we have an antibody. An antibody is this Y-shaped protein that has a very specific shape right here at the ends. And this is an antigen. This is the ligand that binds to the antibody. So this antibody has a specific shape that only recognizes a very specific antigen. And this is all based on the 3D shape of the protein. So your body has just thousands and hundreds of thousands of different types of proteins. And we can classify these proteins by function. So many proteins have widely different functions. Some proteins are structural in that they support your tissues. These are proteins like collagen and elastin. Some are chemical messengers, hormones and growth factors. Some proteins are involved in transport, such as hemoglobin, which transports oxygen. Some are involved in contractile functions, such as muscle contraction. Some are protective proteins, like our antibodies that protect our bodies from uh, foreign bacteria and other uh, pathogens. We have some cell signaling proteins. Some proteins help cells adhere to our um, tissues in our body. And finally, some proteins are catalytic. These are enzymes. So this is the one type of protein we're going to talk about now, is the very special protein called the enzyme. It's the most highly specialized protein. These are central to every process in the cell. The basic idea behind an enzyme is that they catalyze the conversion of a substrate into a product. And when I say catalyze, I mean that proteins speed up chemical reactions. They can enhance reaction rates by a factor of 10 to the fifth, to 10 to the 17th power. So many biological processes in our bodies would happen naturally without enzymes. However, they would happen so slowly that they would be almost non-functional. So what we have is an enzyme that greatly speeds up these chemical reactions. Again, these proteins are not 
consumed by the reactions they catalyze. So they can do the process of converting a substrate to a product over and over again without being used up. The model we use to describe protein function is called the induced fit model. Sometimes you might have heard a model referred to as the lock and key model. This is an older model that does not take into account the change in shape of the enzyme. So if you've heard of lock and key, forget about it. We're talking about induced fit here. So the way this works is both enzyme and substrate undergo dynamic conformational changes upon binding. So when, remember, when we say conformation, we're talking about the shape. So the shape of the substrate and the active side of the protein, when they get close to each other, they both change shape so that they can bind together. So the enzyme changes its shape slightly as the substrate binds. So when the substrate binds, it's now in the correct location that the enzyme can help it react into the two products. So we have an enzyme product complex here, and then the reaction occurs and two products leave the active site of the enzyme, and again the enzyme changes its conformation back to the original shape. This is called the induced fit model. Here we have that uh, molecule we talked about earlier, the enzyme topoisomerase, and its function is to break apart DNA, relax that DNA shape, and then put the DNA back together. So it changes the shape of DNA. It has an active catalytic site. Remember we talked about the three arginines and one tyrosine that are located on widely different parts of the molecule come together. And they come together so that they fit DNA right into the active site. Here in this raspberry colored molecule with this blue backbone. This is DNA and the green molecule here is protein. You can see over here on the right this is the enzyme and this is the substrate which is DNA. DNA fits just perfectly into the active catalytic site of the enzyme such that the enzyme can break the DNA apart, change the DNA's shape, and then bring the DNA back together. So again, the function of this enzyme is heavily based on its shape. And the, uh, the enzyme's shape is based on the specific order of amino acid residues that fold into both secondary and tertiary structures until we have our final functional unit. All right, that's it for our discussion on amino acids, proteins, and enzymes. Thanks for listening.